2021, the first meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee. Congratulations and thank you all for offering to be here and join in. So um, pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so um, by clicking on the link that has been provided. Um, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time, um, which they have done. Uh, in the event that we are unable to do so for reasons of economic, uh, I have to read that part. Um, so we are here. And so what I'd like to do, we have an, a relatively small agenda, but important agenda. What we want to, and the agenda includes doing introductions of our com committee membership. Um, good, having an overview of the library project from the library director, an overview of the finances from the finance director, and talk a little bit about the schedule and where we are. Um, and um, so I will just do introductions and then I'll call on people to introduce themselves and what, why, what their role is here. So I'm Paul Bachelman, the town manager, Sharon. And I'm Sharon Sherry, I'm the director of the Jones Library. In Austin. I'm Austin Sarrett. I'm a member of the Jones Library Board of Trustees. And Alex. Alex Lefebvre, member of the uh, Jones Library Board of Trustees. And George. Uh, George uh, Ryan, representing the town council uh, this one time. Two Georges. Go ahead, George. The other George. Sorry. sorry We're going to have to number ourselves. Uh, George Hicks Richards, the facility supervisor for the Jones Library. And Sean. Sean Mangano, finance director for the town. And Christine. I'm Christine Gray Mullen. I'm one of the two uh, residents uh, that will be selected for the building committee. And Angela. Hello, I'm Angela Mills. I'm Paul's executive assistant, and I am staffing this meeting today. Thank you for doing that, Angela, for doing the minutes and everything. So we appreciate that. Um, so, Sharon, this is an exciting first day. Do you want to give us an update on where we are? Yes, absolutely. I have a, I'm going to share my screen. I have a small PowerPoint Beautiful. presentation. Please hold. Okay. Here we are, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. So I thought we should start by taking a moment to celebrate, uh, take a breath. We did it. We're here. This is really an exciting moment for the town. And now the hard work is going to begin. So what we're going to be doing uh, as the building committee, our charge is to be working with a, a team of consultants, uh, the MBLC, which is the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, the OPM, which is Collier's Project Leaders, and our architects, Feingold Alexander Architects out of Boston. We're going to be developing designs uh, for an expanded and renovated Jones Library, and then we'll get those designed approve, designs approved by both the library trustees and the town manager. And then we're going to be overseeing moving out of the Jones building. We do have to provide services, uh, library services during construction. Uh, construction will take almost two years. And then we'll be moving back in. And then the grand opening is expected to happen in the spring of 2025. Along the way, we're going to be giving presentations, lots of them, uh, to the public, to town council, the library trustees. Uh, we're going to be working with the Mass Historic Commission on the designs. We're going to be working with many different town boards and committees in order to obtain all the appropriate permits. Uh, we're going to form various subcommittees at various stages of the project, such as outreach, design, and landscaping. We're going to review and approve change orders. We will work with the abutters and keep them informed. We're going to work with the Capital Campaign Committee in, in raising extra money. Um, we're going to work with Eversource on energy incentives. And we are going to plan for the grand opening again in 2025. 
So the timeline looks something like this. We're going to start over the next 13 months. We're going to go through schematics, design development, and the construction documentation phases of the project. And during this time, we'll secure an interim location. We'll plan for the relocation of our existing landscaping. Uh, we'll work with an interior designer to choose furnishings, and we'll receive an updated cost estimate. Once the contract documents are complete, in about January of 2023, we'll enter the bid phase of the project. That's when the bid documents will be distributed, the bids will be received, and the construction contracts will be finalized. Then we'll move into construction, which is scheduled to begin in April of 2023 and last for about 23 months. As I said earlier, throughout this time period, library services will be provided elsewhere in town. Once construction is complete, it's expected to take about two months to move uh, the furniture into the building and the fixtures and the equipment, um, after which the grand opening will occur in early 2025. Um, and then project closeout includes certifying that all our liens have been released and submitting the as-built documents to the MBLC. So a few of our immediate next steps include electing a chair to this committee and a clerk, um, completing the committee. We still need um, one or two more uh, residents to join us, hiring Feingold Alexander Architects, uh, putting a deed restriction in place, more about that later, meeting with the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners about our designs, meeting with the Mass Historic Commission about our designs, and establishing these subcommittees. So that's the next four years of our lives in a nutshell. Um, I didn't know if, so on the call is our OPM, uh, stop sharing, uh, is Ken Guyette and Paul, I didn't know if it would be okay if I invited him into the room to, to introduce himself and to say a few words. Hang on, you're muted. Let me intervene for one second. What I should have done first is um, we have not elected a chair. I've been I've sort of called the meeting to order. We should, uh, and what I am suggesting is that we not elect a chair today. Um, that we wait until we have a, a fuller complement of our committee, and that would be our next meeting after the first of the year, I believe. Um, but the the committee should decide who it would like to have run this meeting, and anyone can step up to do that. So I should have done that first. And our, I see no volunteers. <laughs> so with, with that, then I will continue to run the meeting with the permission of the group. Um, and then uh, then at the first order of business at our next meeting will be to elect a chair. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes. And Angela, can you bring Ken into the room? Uh, certainly. And maybe it's a good time to explain um, owner's project manager and what that role is for folks. John, do you wanna take that role or? I can. Wanna... Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we will have a couple part, we'll have probably three partners along the way, maybe more um, consultants, but our, um, our first partner in all this was the owner project manager. Um, who represents the town and our interests, um, will be with us, has been with us from the beginning and will be with us through the end. And they will really just, they have the expertise in the construction world and in the project management world where they will review everything on our behalf or most everything on our behalf um, and try to steer us in the right direction or give us their, their recommendation. Um, so whenever we get invoices in the future, they'll review those. Um, they will be the liaison between us and the designer and us and the construction um, firm somewhere along the way. Um, and really, they are just our, our go to resource for making sure we stay on schedule. Um, a lot of what they do, again, is actually is scheduling and making sure we hit all our milestones, um, which is particularly important with this project because of the MBLC and that there's there's actual tasks that we have to achieve in order to get the MBLC payments. It's really important that we stick to our, um, you know, to, to our timeline that we've laid out. So um, they will do a lot for us. Um, and so far, my experience has been really positive with Collier's. 
And then the, the next partner, sorry, real quick, will be our designer, which we've all met Feingold um, and Alexander. And then at some point along the way, we will do a bid process um, to select a um, contractor to build the library. And as, uh, as the name implies, owner's project manager is that um, the owner's o OPM represents us. They're on our side and they are representing our interests to the other vendors and also as uh, Sean said, helping us to stay on track uh, is a very important role uh, and OPM is, is really worth their weight in gold. So, um, so I'll turn it back over to you, Sharon, if you want to introduce Ken. Yeah, so uh, I can I can actually go on about Ken Gaia for a really long time, which I think he would enjoy, but you all would eventually get bored. Ken has been with us. Um, oh my God, I think I've known Ken for at least 10 years now. It's been a really long time. Uh, he and his colleague, uh, George Barnes, have been working on this project since the beginning, and we're lucky to continue to work with him. And so, Ken, say more about what you'll be doing with us. Oh, Sharon, you're making me blush. Um, well, thank you very much. Very excited to be here today. This is a uh, this is a huge milestone. Um, everybody should be very, very proud of making it this, to this point. At the, and there's still a lot to happen. So uh, the immediate first step, as, as Sharon mentioned, would be to bring the design team on board. Uh, once we get the designer on board, there's going to be a series of, of design uh, working group meetings, the design process. We're going to do our own independent uh, design review process during the, the design phases as well to make sure we've got the tightest set of documents that, that um, we can have before we go out to bid. Um, we're gonna work uh, with the committee in the town to make sure we get a, a, a good group of contractors to bid on the project. Uh, it's a large project. It's one that's gonna generate a lot of excitement in the area. And so we're looking forward to, uh, to getting a good turnout for that as well. And, and like Sean had mentioned earlier, we're gonna be making sure that we're hitting all our milestones uh, and working hand in glove between uh, the town and the MBLC. We've got a long standing relationship with the MBLC going back well over with me well over two decades. So um, it's it's a continuation of that process and we're looking forward to, to jumping right in and, and getting to work on your behalf. Thank you, Ken. Anything else you wanted to talk about, Sharon? I mean, you've been at this as long as anybody, so. And I, I think that's a part of my problem. It's like I know too much. And uh, so I, you know, I didn't know. I know Sean wants to talk about the financing piece, but I didn't know if there were questions from the group or maybe you want Sean to speak first and then we'll go to questions. Let's do Sean. Let's do the finances and then come back to the questions for, for, for anybody. Sean. Okay. So. I was going to talk about the finances in sort of two levels, sort of the, the overall funding for the project and then what to expect um, day to day as we go forward in our role as the building committee. Um, so the overall funding for the project has been secured. Um, there are multiple funding sources. There's the MBLC grant. Um, there will be donations from the Jones Library. There is the town's local share. And then there's also the um, Community Preservation Act funds. Um, so all these different funding sources have already been approved um, by the council and um, which has helped establish the budget that we have to work with. Um, we received our first MBLC payment already, which is great. So that's in the bank. We've got a separate account set up. And as these payments come in, we will um, record them separately. Um, one of the things we're working on right now in terms of the high level financing is um, how do we want to pay for this project? We have a couple different ways we could do this. Um, and our financial advisor, David Eisenthal, who um, has been with the town for a long time, um, is really adept at modeling different things that we want to do. So um, there's, there's two options. One option is where we can start using the grant money right away and use the grant money first and um, borrow as far into the future as we can so that we don't have to take out the debt right now. Um, the other option would be to borrow right now and save the grant money for the future. And so we're looking at these models. Um, so the preliminary uh, thing on my mind is that interest rates are super low right now. Um, we don't know what they'll be in the future. And if we put the MBLC payments away into a bank account, they can generate a modest return that we can then reinvest into the project. Um, 
So I'm sort of leaning that way of think of recommending to Paul that we and then our treasurer that we we use the we borrow sooner rather than later to lock in um, a low interest rate, set the money aside in a bank account, generate that interest, and then reduce the overall cost of the town by earning some money that way. Um, we've talked with Ken and some other town, another town that had done it this way, and it seemed to be pretty successful. Um, the MBLC was was open to either option, so. Um, but still need to see the, the the hard numbers on both of those options before we we commit to one. Um, I don't think that's anything that this committee will have to weigh in on, but we just wanted to share that that's sort of our decision, one of the things we're working on right now with this project. Um, then the finances at a more granular level in terms of this project, we've talked with Ken a little bit. So the OPM will be providing regular updates to this committee on the status of the project. Um, Ken can, can fill us in more if he, if he wants to add, but they will be providing regular budget reports that show our progress, how we're doing. Um, if we're starting to get off track in any particular area that they would identify those. Um, one thing that people, if, you, if you're not already familiar with these, um, you'll become familiar, possible change orders, things that might come up that were not in the original design or in the original plan that then this um, that we have to decide whether we wanna do. Sometimes we don't have much of a decision, um, but sometimes they are, decisions that we could make. Um, so a lot of that will flow through Ken and through the designer um, and will come to this committee. Invoices will come to this committee for approval as well. We've um, had some discussions about how that will happen. Um, probably not for today, but at some point we'll decide, um, does the whole committee just want to approve them? Do we want to form a subcommittee? Um, again, all invoices will be reviewed and approved by the OPM first. Um, so that by the time they get to us, we know they will look at them as well, but we'll know they've been vetted by the, our, our representative who's looking at the, the details behind the invoice to make sure they're on track. Um, and yeah, so I think, I think that's what to expect is that there'll be regular invoices at meetings to approve. There will be regular budget reports. Um, and our main role is just to try to make sure that the ship is heading in the right direction and, and is on track. Good. Thank you, Sean. Um, I think we already talked about timeline. So let's see what kinds of questions, concerns people have, um, comments, whatever. And it, we like to use either raise hand for verbally or virtually is either one, either way, Austin. So thank you, Paul. Um, just a couple of uh, observations and then really a question for Ken, which will reflect a little bit of my uh, nervousness or anxiety. So I, I, since this is the first meeting of the committee, I, I do want to say um, yet again, and it cannot be said enough, how important uh, Sharon Sherry has been in this process. Uh, she has been a steady hand, uh, 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 an excited uh, cheerleader for the project, and really a never say die force uh, for uh, the library and most importantly for the people who use it. So whatever this whatever uh, this comes to, and I am confident will come to a beautiful and functional library which will serve the town for decades to come, we owe it to Sharon. I also want to thank Paul and Sean. Leadership in the town played a critical role um, throughout the process, but but really in the a lead up to the town council uh, conversation and in the lead up to the vote, uh, Paul and Sean played a critical role. And last thing I wanna say, and George can convey it, is uh, to express the trustees gratitude to the town council for their really very careful, they put us through our paces. When we started this, I was six foot four and blonde and this is all that's left of me because of the questions that George and his colleagues on the town council met, made us answer. But that process, which was no fun, uh, actually rebounded to the great benefit of the, of, of the, of the project. Now, en enough celebration, here's to anxiety. Ken, um, we're a long way up, out from um, a bid process for contractors. So I know the answer to my question is, who can say what will be? But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your expectation about um, how competitive this, how attractive this process is gonna to be to um, contractors and subcontractors. 
and in, most importantly, how you will help us with Sean um, keep within budget as costs uh, inflate. So first, whatever you can tell us about the attractiveness, who's likely to bid uh, on the contract. And secondly, uh, what can you tell us about the fiscal management, how we're gonna keep to our budget, given that uh, the project budget was set a long time ago? Sure, great questions. So for the, for the first part of that question, um, so we know um, having done a tremendous amount of work in the Pioneer Valley, um, you know, all the contractors in the area. So in addition to making sure that we're gonna have a, a good project to put out on the street, we're gonna make sure that we're gonna be out there actively soliciting these contractors well ahead of time, make sure that they've got slots open in their schedule that they know that they can come and, and take a really hard look at this project. It is going to be extremely, um, it's going to be a very big project for a lot of contractors in the area. There's not a lot of libraries that are at this size uh, around, and um, there's not a lot of big projects happening in this area outside of, outside of say, Springfield. Uh, there are some really good general contractors that have a lot of horsepower that can really um, put their mind to getting this thing done and done on time. Uh, a lot of good subcontractors in the area. And we're going to make sure that we actively solicit all of them. Um, uh, just in point of reference, uh, Cape Cod Tech was a project that we just finished up uh, out in Harwich, Massachusetts. Not exactly Amherst, but still, it was it was uh, one of the projects that we actually went out to 80 different contractors to solicit and to make sure that they were aware of the project ahead of time. That project ultimately came in about 10% under budget, um, and so. By, by getting that breadth of, of contractors, not only on the general contractor side, but also on the filed sub bid side, um, we're gonna hopefully get a, a really good spread and a really good um, um, participation from a lot of different contractors and that'll help drive that cost down. Um, how we look at this as we're going forward, cost is always paramount to us. We're always thinking about cost quality and schedule as we're going through any of our projects. Uh, you know, that, that is a stool that uh, you take one of those legs and that stool is going to fall over. So um, we have to find that right balance when it comes to the schedule, um, when it comes to ensuring that the quality is appropriate for the building type, building that's going to last 50 plus years, that's going to, you know, uh, again, be a mainstay in, in the town for a long, long time to come. We want to make sure that the, the materials are appropriate but along with those materials comes a cost. So we're gonna be constantly weighing all three of those aspects as we're going forward. And, you know, Sharon had mentioned that we're gonna do a, at least one more um, cost estimate during the design process. Um, we have more than one estimator look at those. The designer has their estimator, the owner has an estimator, and we look at it together and we reconcile those costs to get a really good idea of what that value is gonna be. And regardless of whether we're on budget at that point or not, we still look at value management, how we can come up with alternatives to ensure that when we go out to bid, that we're gonna have a successful bid opening and that we're gonna be able to bring the project uh, through into construction. That means maybe setting up a list of alternates um, to ensure that we've got that cost certainty when the bids come in uh, and make sure that we've got a very viable project to move, to move forward. Um, we also have escalation um, built into the budget, you know, again, this, this is a budget that was established back in 2016. So we only had a certain amount of escalation there, but there's contingencies and other things in there too that we can hopefully ensure that we're going to have a very, very good project uh, for the town um, going forward. Did that answer your questions, Austin? Good. Other comments or questions people have? Alex? Um, thanks. Um, Ken, I guess I have two questions. One's a follow-up to Austin's question. So um, COVID put us behind a year, and then obviously the vote put us behind another six months. And so, and then I think we're now waiting for our new town council to be elected to really move forward. And so I guess what I'm trying to understand is for our time, like, when do we really, like, <laughs> How long can we delay making decisions? Like when do things really need to happen? Um, because my worry is the longer we wait to start making decisions, the more the cost escalates. And the second question, which is unrelated, 
Um, I've had community members approach me about the contractors that we would use for the project and if there's a way to build into the process using contractors that are owned um, by BIPOC, uh, BIPOC community or owners, I guess. Um, and so I think understanding if we're constrained by anything in terms of doing that, if that's a possibility or understanding our ability to try to make sure we're using contractors or subcontractors even, that might be the more reasonable option um, that are black owned or uh, people of color owned businesses. Yeah, so we will have to answer the second part first, we will have uh, thresholds that we're in goals that we're gonna have to try to achieve on the contracting side. So that will definitely be part of uh, the contracting process for subcontractors and for general contractors. So we will absolutely have have uh, minority and uh, and um, uh, women owned business um, thresholds and goals that we're gonna have to try to try to meet per the um, uh, office of the uh, SDO. Um, as far as the first question, part of your question is concerned, um, we one of the things that we may want to look at and want to think think about is asking the estimators who worked on the original estimate back when we did the um, uh, did the grant application is to just recast their estimate based on today's market. Short money, they don't have to do any additional takeoffs. It's just fit, it's just basically where it was in 2016 compared to where it is today. And that could give us a really good snapshot of where the construction dollars lie right now. And then obviously they've got a better pulse on anybody um, on where the market is going forward and what to factor in for any sorts of escalation beyond your, your standard 4% year over year. Is it eight, is it six, where is it right now? And be able to really start having those difficult discussions about what we're gonna do with the project is, is it meaning, is it changing materials? Is it changing methodologies? Is it changing um, and, and modifying program? I mean, what, what does that all mean to the project at this point in time going forward? At least it gives us a snapshot to be able to then factor in going forward and how we're gonna uh, attack this. Okay, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so just so we did do that in a sense when we got the sustainability piece added, but that one's already, I guess, what a year and a half. That's right. That, that would have had to start construction, I think, in April. So, right. so updating the most current one is what you're suggesting, not necessarily the 2016 one. Well, that's right, and and having both again, having both the estimators take a look at their numbers. That's why I brought it back to 2016 just again to get that reconciliation that we want to make sure that we're we're getting a good. Uh, idea of where the number is, not just from one specific estimator, but a couple of them. Gotcha. Thanks for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Paul, one quick follow-up. Um, Ken, I'll, I'll email this to you if you don't have it already. Do you already have the new um, responsible employer construction bylaw? I believe we do, yes. Okay. Um, just and for Alex, so that bylaw, in addition to what Ken mentioned, that bylaw also lays out targets for um, who we contract with as part of the project. Great. Thanks. And cannot for um, in terms of getting the estimate, do you think you're saying do that timing, you know, do that estimate now or do it further down the road? I mean, when, when is the time when that information will be valuable to us? Because, you know, any when it's a, it's a snapshot, right? And then it starts to age. That's right. So so I think, Paul, I think it would be good to get a snapshot of where we, where we are now. Um, we always want to do one as we get further on down the road in the construction documents or later on in design development to make sure that we're on the right track. But right now, we really need to get a snapshot of where things are today because there's been a fair amount of time between the last iteration. What, what did that, what did the market do to that number between then and now just to confirm and then, and then move forward from there. And as we're moving through the design process, we're keeping that number in mind. We're working back towards that, again, that ultimate budget number and what does that mean to the project, understanding where that estimate, that recast estimate put us? And then as we work into design development, we do another estimate, reconcile it, make sure that we're still on budget going forward, look at value management alternatives in case we need them at bid date and, and keep, keep things moving forward in that, in that manner. And when you say it's short money, what does that mean? So what does that mean? So typically a, a schematic design estimate 
um, is, is between five and $7,000. To recast an estimate that's already been done is probably gonna be half that, if, if that. Uh, it might be just a matter of them looking at their formulas and, and uh, updating the escalation to, to, to bring it into today's dollars. Uh, and that would be something that we'd want to talk about and we'd bring back to the to the committee to, to discuss further if that's the if that's the right thing um, for the project to go forward on. So is that something the committee wants to do? Anybody have thoughts on that? I think it's a good idea to um because of the delay to know right now before we get moving, has there been a change because of just the delay? Um it'll allow us to sort of separate what are things that might change down the road when we start to get into design versus what was the impact of just that um that span of time so again if it's really relatively inexpensive i think it makes sense to get a, an updated figure christine i also agree with sean i think it would be a good idea and just it's not just about finances i'd be interested on any input they have on uh, schedule i know we want this done you know, by early 2025, but supply chains, uh, they might have some insight on that. And um, I know Ken might be able to give us ideas about if, which is kind of a change of um, industry practices right now, of buying stuff more ahead, you know, right, and actually storing it offsite and capturing what you can earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's absolutely right. Yep. Good ideas. Other comments or questions or so we have Ken here. Okay. Um, okay. So we're sort of like, what are the next steps, next meeting date? Um, what time of day is good to meet? Um, what's, you know, what's the pleasure of the group? So let's, let's talk to the, to the people who aren't, like Christine and Austin and Alex, um, what what do you like to do? Um, I'd like to meet soon and often. So the, the question is when, um, when, and th that will affect the day and the time. Be when when would we be looking to a next meeting with something substantive to do? I would think the you know probably the second week of January, okay. the week of January 10th. I think by then we may have a, um, a broader, you know, additional uh, counselor um, just representing the council, possibly. Um, Great. So, you... yeah, for, for yeah. me, either um, start of the day or end of the day is going to be better than the middle of the day. So that's as a general rule, either bright and early or uh, you know, as late as people are willing to, to meet in the afternoon. Christine and Alex. Um, I'm very flexible. Um, so whatever is best for others. Okay, Alex. I'm generally flexible. The key is just getting it on my calendar so that I stay flexible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we pick a day? Go ahead, Christine. Just uh, following up on Austin's uh, frequently, um, what is that expectation? Is this like twice a month, every week, or <laughs> once a month? I, mean, I think typically it sort of goes in waves, right? It, it yeah. starts off and then it drifts, drifts away. Um, and I, and I, you know, with it, we'll have a, a real firm agenda for the next meeting about you know, whether we want subcommittees, um, what's, what's a more detailed timeline look like? What about community engagement? Um, you know, that type of thing. So I think we will have a fair amount of work up front and then it might drift off a, for a little bit. And then when it comes back into actual design, it tends to be much more frequent. So, I mean, Ken, you've done these before. So what, what's your experience? Yeah, that's exactly right, Paul. So typically what we do is we'll, we'll say, let's, let's schedule out meetings every once every two weeks uh, for the committee. And then we're able to peel back meetings if, and cancel them if we don't need them, but at least having that in everybody's calendars and keeping that cadence going. I think that, that seems to work out the best. And then if there happens to be a subcommittee or a working group that meet on the opposite weeks, 
um, that, that keeps the flow of information going and everybody uh, kind, of, kind of moving as expeditiously as possible. So let's not choose all those meetings, but just let's choose our next meeting um, today. And let's look at the week of January 10th, which is so far out that I'm sure Alex's calendar is totally open. Um, <laughs> so I'll go to Austin, why don't you suggest some uh, days? How about, how about um, like four o'clock on the 12th? Would that work for people? Or 4.30? That works for me. Good. I like Christine, Christine. already. <laughs> Sean. George. George I'd Hicks. Um, I'd lean closer to four if possible, just because I have okay. a meeting at six. Okay. And Sharon? Yeah, four would be better. I think we're going to have to be at, with the historic commission that night. So four would be great. Right. Ken? I serve at the pleasure of the committee, so whatever you okay. decide. Okay, so let's, our next meeting will be January 12th at 4 p.m. And we'll take responsibility for posting that and putting it and I'll work with Sharon and Sean to get and Ken to get an agenda together. Um, good. Um, anything else anybody wants to bring up to, for today's meeting? Uh, George, Ryan. Yeah, just uh, managing expectations vis-a-vis -vis the council. It meets on January 3 and then it doesn't meet again until January 24th. So you may likely not have a counselor present for the first and maybe even the second meeting in January. Um, I'll reach out to Lynn, but uh, at the moment we have no idea who the president will be of the new council. Um, so I think just FYI, um, there may be a, a, a couple weeks where uh, you won't have a counselor present. I don't think that's going to impact um, anything uh, really that seriously, but just, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um... Thank you for raising that because that's a it's a, a a concern. But I think what we would probably do is, if any counselor who is interested in serving and wasn't appointed yet could attend the meetings and be present, just by. And I don't know if we'll be actually taking votes on anything anyway. But it's about staying up to speed if they if they are appointed. And these are council appointments, right, George? They're not president appointments. Uh yes, the council votes on who. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So yeah. Good. Thank you for that. Any other things? Christine? I just, um, Austin did a nice job of thanking people. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Austin and Alex as to the board. And just as a resident, anyone who is following this, um, your efforts were appreciated and amazing. Um, and so long, long going. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. It's exciting to be at this point. And it was so much of, of you all. So hopefully you're not too burned out and tired. <laughs> Ready to go. I want to meet twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Christine. Any other comments from members before I open it up to public comment? Oh, Alex. Yeah, I just... Um, wanted to quickly comment, point out. So I know we're not making any uh, committee chair decisions because we don't have the totality of the group here, but the likelihood of us having it at the next meeting seems low since if we have another member of the public joining, we already have a meeting date set and we're probably not gonna have a town counselor. So as much as I wanna push forward, I, I'm not sure how different this group will look at our next meeting. So I don't know what that means for scheduling and agenda, but just putting it out as a reminder. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, that's a good point. I think what one of the first item on the agenda for next time will be to elect a chair. And the committee also always has the um, wherewithal to change chairs if it so chooses, if the membership changes or whatever reason. I do want people to think about the role of chair and who would like to serve in that function. Um, I can tell you I don't. And um, I think there's a lot of people who might already say they don't, but just to have it be there so people can start to think about if they're willing to take on that responsibility. It's a pretty important role. It's a very important role and, and a, a real responsibility. So we encourage the person to do it, who does it to be prepared for that work. 
Uh, Sharon. Yeah, uh, I'm interested um, to hear when we'll be able to hire uh, the architects. That's my question. So what's that process? Ken, can you help us with that process? Sure. So, um, you know, immediately after we're brought on board, we'll solicit a proposal from the uh, design team, uh, along with their scheduled work plan to ensure that aligns with our expectations. We'll probably have a couple of back and forths. Um, we'll get that number negotiated down as far as we possibly can. And then we'll present it to the committee for, uh, for approval and going forward. And how long does that process normally take? Let's pretend nothing slows us down. <laughs> Usually within uh, a week or two, I will have a back okay. and forth uh, with Jim and, and whoever else, Alan or whoever, Tony, uh, to make sure that we get that turned around. I'm sure they're chomping at the bit. Just like yeah. In January, is we, so that's something we can do in January for sure. Right. Uh, that, that would be my, my hope, yep. And so, Sean and Paul, do do we think that we can get Colliers on board ASAP? That's the hope. Just yeah, just looking at everything now. No, no problems. Just um, making sure everything's lined up and in an order. So okay, um, thank you. Yeah, no, there's no no hurdles that I'm aware of right now. Good, good questions, clarifications. Thank you. Anything else anybody has? We'll come back. I'm going to open it up for public comment. If any member of the public would like to comment, um, please raise your hand. We'll bring you into the room for three minutes of comment. And we do have four members of the public in the audience. So people know, oftentimes people ask, how many people are at the meeting? So we do have four members of the public. Um, if any, any of you would like to say something, you're welcome to do that now. and not seeing any takers and not seeing any other business before the committee, I think that concludes our business for today, right? Good. So we'll see everybody January 12th at 4 p.m., if not sooner, and just wish everybody good holidays and thank you for stepping forward and taking on this role. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Take care.